you've been welcomed so warmly by so many people that I'm not going to add much uh, to that. I would like to say one thing uh, that has been, I think, uh, implied by both Golan Shachar and by uh, Yoel Eritzur before I think that uh, you're here at a very crucial juncture in the history of Israeli clinical psychology. And I think this conference uh, might really go into history as a, not only as a symbol, but as a catalyst for a new period in which uh, warring factions that uh, used to believe that they uh, have the ultimate truth about how, and of course the ultimate ritual of how to treat people, uh, will stop warring and instead interacting. Uh, I think uh, Rivka and I have kind of, uh, we thought about questions, and we're going to do it more or less like this. Rivka is going to ask more specific questions uh, on uh, the matter, and I'm going to ask some uh, speculate, uh, ask you to speculate about some future developments, uh, and very much looking forward. Please, Rivka, why don't you start? Okay, as Carlos said, we are going to uh, switch back and forth between talking or asking Paul about the present uh, status of, of psychotherapy and integrative uh, psychotherapy and, and between the future of it. So um, I would like to start with the question that Golan has set the stage well for, for this question by asking you about um, the nature of integration because it seems that the worldviews of many of the uh, approaches to therapy are really so different and sometimes uh, contradictory that um, integration might be possible only at the level of techniques or tools, or uh, Golan uh, mentioned um, assimilation of tools by one approach to use it, so it, it seems like um, psychodynamic uh, therapist is doing really cognitive work, but I would like to ask you about the contradictions at the theoretical level, and if you think they are really concilable. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, I feel that in some way uh, it really shouldn't be me who answers this question, but Golan, because he did such a good job of representing my own thinking. And in effect, <laughs> you now know uh, why I wear a mustache. It's to differentiate me from Golan, because <laughs> otherwise he says what I say as perfectly as I can imagine. Um, but um, I, I think part of the, the experience, which I certainly understand what you're referring to, but uh, part of the experience of these fundamentally different philosophies is that part of the problem in the way psychotherapy has been organized is that psychotherapy has been organized around competing tribes or ethnic groups. I mean, we, we really, we describe ourselves as holding particular theoretical visions. But the reality, I think, is that the dynamics of the interactions between psychoanalysts and cognitive behavior therapists and family therapists and so on really resemble much more inter-ethnic conflict than scientific debate or intellectual debate. And the reason I say that is what are the characteristics of inter-ethnic conflicts? You see a, a tremendous amount of caricaturing of the other and creating of stereotypes of the other. Could everybody please, let's do a little <coughs> ritual. Everybody check whether a cell phone is out, so we're not going to have more of those. Just let's all check, so we're not going to have this for the rest of the day. And whoever didn't check now, please make sure. And, 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 and I'm sure, not, I don't really mean this, but it would, it would be in the spirit of what I was just saying, that all the psychoanalysts in the audience think that the phones are cognitive behavior therapists' phones, <laughs> and vice versa. Um, I mean, that's the way we have organized ourselves. And so group identity is a very powerful source of the, the sense that there's us 
and there's them, and we're fundamentally different. I, and I think that one of the places where then <coughs> clinical and theoretical thinking potentially meets empirical evidence-based thinking, and we'll be talking about this through the three days in different ways, is that if that uh, the, the notion of evidence-based practice would be much more soundly based if instead of testing a particular brand name of therapy, which is the way evidence-based practice is currently pursued, instead what was examined is the fundamental principles and processes that underlie behavior change and personality change. And I think that if we direct our research not to the brand name labels, not to the ethnic identities that are so powerfully organized by the groups we interact with, you know, we, we like and identify with the groups we meet with. Psychoanalysts meet with psychoanalysts. Cognitive behavior therapists meet with cognitive behavior therapists. And a group coherence develops that creates a hard shell that's very difficult to penetrate. So if we can move from that to the investigation of fundamental principles and processes, then I think we're likely to find that there's more commonality. Now, just one other thing before I let myself be interviewed again instead of just filibustering. Um, but I, I think one other important point about this, when I highlight these principles that cut across different ethnicities in our field, that doesn't mean that cognitive behavior therapists and psychoanalysts do the same thing. It does mean that many of the same principles underlie what they do, but part of what makes integration of interest and useful is that each brings some somewhat different things to bear. So that it's not that they're just all doing the same thing with a different name. We can learn from each other also from the differences, but they're not utterly fundamental differences, necessarily. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question where I really don't expect an, a simple answer, I, I've been, but it's something that I seriously have been breaking my head over uh, for quite some time. I think uh, the language of psychology has been, for quite some time, I would say somewhere between 1930 and about 1980, 1990, was the way the Western middle classes understood themselves. Um, I think two things happened. One is that the biological paradigm is becoming much more, uh, much stronger and it seems to replace culturally what we once used to be able to give. The other thing is, you see, I, I, am, I, uh, I, I love your description of you know, this, inter this group between, uh, uh, conflict between, between ethnic groups. Uh, what I'm sometimes, in addition to that, bothered by is the following. On the one hand, I think we're on the verge of becoming a really responsible profession and something that looks like, less like a religion. Then on the other hand, in the grand, uh, in the grand old days where you know, the Freuds and Jungs uh, could speculate freely, uh, the field had a certain metaphorical uh, or, or a certain uh, fertility in the metaphorical and narrative uh, sense that exactly allowed for people to connect to it outside the profession. Do you think there is any way that we will be able to uh, combine between the scientific responsibility that we're striving for now and this type of metaphorical and narrative fertility that we seem to be losing? It's a very interesting question. Um, and, I, and I think it relates in a way to the skills that we have if we're really good as psychotherapists, that the principles that I was referring to, that's the kind of basic structure. I mean, if we think of, say, architecture, every architect learns sort of basic physics and mechanics 
and hopefully knows how to build a building so that it will stand up, not collapse. That's the common sort of scientific principles. But that doesn't mean that every architect is equal. You know, there are very pedestrian buildings and there are extraordinary buildings. And there's the art and the poetry that a great architect adds to the physics. And I think in a way, as psychotherapists, we need to know the science, but we also, as much as we can for each of our individual talents, we need to be poets. We need to have a way of reaching people so that our words get inside and transform. And I think in the same way, when we communicate to the public, we want to do that. We want to be as compelling as possible. Maybe in the ways that we communicate amongst ourselves, we might want to tone that down a little bit because we want to find more of a common language and less of a kind of a star system, which is part of what you were describing. Psychotherapy for, for years was organized by a star system. And there was Freud and there was Jung and there were all the great poets. And even some of the top people in CBT rose to the top because in a different poetic language, they spoke compellingly to their readers. And I think there, amongst ourselves, we might actually want to tone down the poetry, but with our patience and with the public, I think we might want to cultivate it. Um, I, I would like to take uh, Carlos' um, question a bit further by uh, asking if you think that, um, that it might be that uh, we won't be using psychotherapy in the future, that um, medicine will you know, or substitute it, or other kinds of alternative therapies uh, because, because of technology, because of biology, because of the brain studies that we are having. Are you afraid of the future of psychotherapy? Well, I'm always afraid of the future. Uh, <laughs> um, but I also have some sort of optimistic threads, which I think you need to have to be a psychotherapist, you know, because you're trying to instill that uh, in other people. I think Jerome Frank stated particularly well that one of the key things we address in the people we work with is a sense of demoralization. So we want to somehow find a way to create hope. Um, but I, 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 let me take one example. Um, I, I think part of what you're saying, uh, in certain ways, the disappearance of sort of the sectarian field of psychotherapy might not be such a loss in the sense that to the degree that we integrate it with the medical biological side, and very importantly, with the social side. And an awful lot of what we work with are the consequences of the way our societies are organized, are the consequences of the way families and cultures are organized. And change through those media, uh, I think, should eventually occupy a large portion of our efforts to change. But that doesn't make our work outmoded for at least two reasons. One is that ultimately, in order really to help any, any individual with their suffering, with their suffering or on the other side, equally important, with their not thriving sufficiently, because I don't think our work is just limited to symptoms or suffering, it's also focused on enabling people to thrive. And for either, we need to develop the skill of understanding them deeply and understanding their subjective world and how it's related to the life they're living. That's a fundamental skill that I can't imagine being without if we're going to be effective. So that's a place where our skills will always be relevant. 
I also think if we think, for example, of the advances in neuroscience, um, which are going to make very, very important contributions to all sorts of efforts, hopefully, to improve human experience, human life. But, none, but the idea that they will make us outmoded, I think, in a way misunderstands neuroscience because the neuroscience is only as good as the psychology, which also is the, but it's also the case that the psychology ultimately may only be as good as the neuroscience. It's a back and forth. Because after all, when, we, when you do a study and you find a certain part of the brain lights up in an fMRI, how do you know what that means unless you correlate it with some aspect of psychological experience? Otherwise, it's just a light show, right? We need to know what it's related to. The more finely tuned our psychological understanding is, the more we understand the variations in what lights up in the brain. At the same time, when we notice a part of the brain lighting up that we didn't expect, that can direct us to look more closely at how was the difference in psychological experience then from when the brain lit up a different way. That can then lead us to refine our psychological descriptions which in turn gives us a tool for further refining the neuroscience. And it bootstraps back and forth. So I really think of them ultimately not as rivals, but as essentially needing each other to advance. Um, talking about integration, I, 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 I used the occasion to ask you all the questions that I have no idea how to go about. Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> Basically, what in the last decade, what I've been trying to do is figure out what, how very accelerated historical processes, how they uh, impact us. And uh, one of the things I can say that whenever I finish a book, I feel, I feel it's already outmoded by, by the development. For example, you know, we, we, we can't, I can't remember the world before Google, even though I met Google when I was rather adult, not at Facebook, etc. Now, one of the things that I'm bugged by is the following. I feel that we haven't found ways to help our students develop a methodology to learn about the world they live in. If you take Golan's case, okay, he has a very, he has a very in-depth picture of the whole uh, uh, so socio-psychological ecosystem of his patients. And one of the things that I'm finding out is that I, I since I, I don't have a methodology myself, I know that I understand the world fairly well, among other things, because my patients ta taught me. And the question is, what, in addition to all the things that we are teaching, and we're teaching more and more, precisely when you go in this direction, do you see any reasonably uh, fruitful way in which we could integrate, I don't know what to call it, uh, sociological knowledge, uh, uh, an input on how to read social trends uh, that will help our students and us to treat our patients uh, uh, appropriately. You are good at posing the challenging questions. Um, I, uh, my first association is uh, a kind of an awareness that especially at my age, you know, at thinking of the kinds of social changes you're referring to. I, I have a sense of, in certain ways, sort of viewing life through a rear view mirror. You know, that, that there are things that are changing, and I'm moving ahead, but uh, there are things that I'm, I'm not really able to fully join or, or engage. And you mentioned Facebook, for example. I, uh, shamefully and proudly at the same time can say I don't have a Facebook page. I do use Google. I'm not that, uh, that much of a caveman, but I'm not yet on, on Facebook. Uh, okay. I, right, and I know, right, because I, I remember a day when I said I wasn't going to go on email. That it, and I was half right. You know, it made my life easier and it made my life harder. 
you know, and I think all of these things do. Uh, and in one sense, you know, I, I think part of, uh, and I don't really know how fully to, to answer the question, but I, I think part of it is that learning, the more learning is genuinely a mutual process. So that I, I'm aware there were things about life that I have to learn from my students because they are natives of uh, a, a culture that I am trying to be an immigrant to. Um, and I can't come to it with full knowledge. And that in a way it's an extension of, you know, a couple of people already, and I think you may have been one of them in, in the introductory remarks, uh, referred to the importance of humility. And, and I think that that is one of our essential skills as a therapist. We need to be both bold and confident because we are in a leadership position with our patients, uh, but we also need to be humble. We need to be constantly learning. You know, I think we learn from our patients. We, we can't be too convinced that we see things correctly. And part of what psychotherapy integration is, is to come into discussions with uh, colleagues, not just to teach them, but to learn from them, which is certainly part of what I'm hoping for in these three days. I'm not just talking, I'm, I'm listening. And probably what will be most interesting to me when I come home is what I heard much more than what I said, because what I said is what I'm bored with. I'm familiar with it already, but what I'm hearing is new. And I think particularly relevant in terms of what you're alluding to is that students of culture, students of history, um, are not usually the people psychotherapists spend a lot of their time listening to, studying, paying attention to. And I think we need to. Uh, I think the culture of the world is changing right beneath our feet. And we as psychotherapists have only one kind of grasp on that. But the more different ways that we can get some additional perspective on the world we're living in and our patients are living in. Because I, I think one of, you know, Go, Golan referred to the, my emphasis on the contextual unconscious. You know, we live in the world. And one of the ways that therapists go wrong, and this is just as much true for many versions of cognitive behavior therapy as it is for very classical analysis, is that it's a kind of inner world, intrapsychic preoccupation that forgets that we live in the world. And so, yes, we need to keep learning about how the world is shifting under our feet. Um, in one of your books, uh, you describe your uh, cyclical model as um, integrating between the explanatory narrative the one that tells us why we became so and, and what made us uh, feel such and such, and the narrative of possibilities. And I would like to ask you about the narrative of possibilities of the in integrative uh, approach. What, what possibilities and, and challenges you foresee for your approach in the future? Well, uh, when I was, and, and again, it's a, a very generative question that has got my, my head spinning already. Because um, when I think of the, the narrative of, of possibilities when I wrote about that term, what I was mainly thinking of then was the, the way that um, our psychological theories tend to be pathology-centered. Uh, so that the narrative of explanation, which is how did the person get that way? What went wrong early in life that set them on a, the wrong course? 
The problem with that is that it can be very, it can lead to a very fixed and a, in a certain sense pessimistic way of viewing people. So that our diagnostic labels, for example, once we label somebody, say, as borderline, that changes the whole set of possibilities we envision for change, and it fixes the way we view them. Whereas if we are treating people not as representatives of a diagnostic entity, but as human beings struggling with conflict and challenges, and look at where they possibly are heading, founded not just on the limits. I mean, we clearly have to have our eyes open to really see what's wrong. If we're in denial, we're not going to help the person. So when I see somebody who's borderline, I can't pretend nothing is wrong. But at the same time, we have to really root things in their strengths uh, and, the, and the possibilities for new change. And we have to lend that to them. Uh, so that's what I had in mind mainly. Uh, the last thing, because I, I can read social cues, and I saw Ilani stand up, so I'm, and I don't have a watch in front of me, so I'm sure we're toward the point where we should stop. Um, but I, I, I was stimulated by what you're saying, by your question and the way you phrased it, to also think about a, a different kind of narrative of possibilities, which are the possibilities that come out of a conference like this, in a sense. The possibilities that come from encountering each other, hearing each other, and finding new combinations, new configurations that we hadn't seen. And, and again, to sort of link the attentiveness to the positive and openness to not denying the negative, I, I, I want to sort of end this with, with, with a, a plea, in a sense, that as much as there, this has so far been a wonderful cooperative atmosphere and we're liking each other, I also know, you know, I've had my informants over the last couple of days in Israel. <laughs> I know there are lots of divisions and lots of tensions and lots of ways in which some people think other people are just all wet or it's nonsense or it's superficial or it's this or it's that. And I want to make a plea that we hear all these challenges that I've heard Israelis are very good at. Uh, I want to really hear them so that in our discussion we can really confront them. So yes, I want us to be nice to each other, but I want it to be around the most difficult questions. Thank you for this great dialogue. Um, although uh, Rivka and Carla were a great interviewer, I would like to invite one or two questions from the audience. Yes, please. Um, one of the difficulties I have trying to be a therapist is that I haven't found a man yet, or a manual, or a guide. Um, there's all these ideas, there's all these ways of putting them together, but there's no one way. And when you kind of leave the brand name label, as you call it, you're left kind of lonely um, without all of that. Um, one of the struggles I have is that there's um, each, each Well, may, maybe not doing it right just means not doing it their exact way, mm -hmm. which is not this different from not doing it right. Um, I would say I, I, I hope that over the course of these three days, for example, that I will offer a map and a guide, but I will not offer a manual. Um, 
I, I have a lot of problems with manuals, which probably will come up in the course of our discussion. Uh, I think w when you use a map, if you look at a map, you can use a map to go to many different places from many different places. A map isn't just directions from one place to another. Uh, so I think we need a map. We need a very coherent framework. But it's, it should, it's a framework that should enable us to go in many ways. I will, in, uh, in one of the case illustrations that I, I offer later, describe a way of using exposure with a psychodynamic accent and in a way that my own biased view is that it enhances both and then we'll have a chance to look at that together and, and see. Okay, another question and we'll go to the break. Yes. Well, I, I think in some ways, I, I would say that in, in just about every case, if we're working at our best, part of what we're paying attention to is the, the larger social context as well. One example that comes to mind, um, a, a, a month or two ago, I was giving some workshops in Japan. And as part of that, Ellen and I went to a smaller meeting of a, an integrative institute that specialized in family therapy. And they were presenting to us a couple's case in which one of the central issues was that the, the wife was complaining and unhappy about the fact that this couple hardly had sex anymore. Um, they had been married, I think, 10 years or so, and they just no longer had sex. Two very, two, well, three really crucial cultural contextual elements of it were, on the one hand, that that, it, we learned, was a rather common phenomenon in Japan. Japan is a relatively unusual society in, in that respect, I would think, uh, that that happens modally to some degree. That's one, one side. Second part of it is there is nonetheless related to the kinds of changes that Carlo was referring to, intergenerational changes happening so that part of this woman's upset was she was of a generation of women who were beginning to not be so happy with this arrangement and are complaining about what was understood to be just the way things are. And then a third element that came up was that a part of the husband's explanation, I think it, it was due to much more than this, but I think this was a factor we shouldn't underestimate. He said, you know, I work every night till midnight. I come home exhausted. I don't have time. And the question that came to my mind was, something very fundamental has to change 
because this wasn't just his own, it was, his was only an exaggeration of a societal process in Japan. Something about people working every night till midnight is contributing to this kind of pattern. And indeed, in terms of reciprocal dynamics, not having sex makes it not that important to come home, uh, a good reason to work late. Working late is a good reason not to have sex. You're exhausted. They replicate each other. And the, it, the, what, what's happening in the intimate life of individuals and the ways that a society is organized aren't really separate realms. They create and recreate each other. So here's maybe a slightly more dramatic uh, version of how one pays attention to it. But I think if we look closely, almost every case has elements of what are the social values that really ought to change, but people just take them in, live them out, and they account for a good portion of the problems that we attribute just to intrapsychic factors. Okay. Thank you very much. We are. Thank you.